Welcome back to Mission 43's Education Discovery Series, where we talk about popular career paths and the education to get you there. So it's great to have Sean Scott here with PlexTrack. We're going to talk a little bit about cybersecurity, the education it takes to get you into the career path. So Sean, thanks so much for oh, being happy here. To be here. Thank and you. again, thank you for allowing us some of your busy schedule. Pleasure. <laughs> I want to know a little bit more about your background, so both military and then civilian, what you do now. Sure. Um, well, it's been a very unlikely path. Uh, I actually finished up uh, in the Air Force in the Idaho Air Guard, uh, commanding a cyber operations squadron, but that was my fourth career uh, in the military. But I've always been a geek, um, probably <laughs> <laughs> my entire life. Um, and so what really attracted me about the Ford Air Control mission was the technology, was all the radios and all the different things we got to play with, the lasers, you know, uh, things that you need to do from the ground to help aircraft find the right targets on, you know, that are on the ground. So we're, we're dropping bombs where we should and not where we shouldn't, right? And uh, I actually uh, did a lot of work, uh, not just for the Guard, but for the Air Force um, in, that, in that space and, and became a subject matter expert on uh, air to ground data links. Mm -hmm. um, so how does that still get me into cybersecurity? <laughs> Um, well, I was a senior officer at that point. Uh, so as much fun as I have running around on the training ranges, they don't give me many opportunities to actually go out and do the job, right? Right. Um, so um, in uh, about 2015, um, Idaho was notified that they would be receiving a new mission, uh, a defensive cyber operations squadron mission. Okay. A mission's got to be run by somebody, an officer, right? And so they looked around and they're like, who knows anything about technology? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so I got the call, um, and so in, uh, in early 2016, uh, we stood up the 224th Cyber Operations Squadron uh, out of Gowan Field, uh, about 71 operators um, that, uh, and who are currently on mission right now today on their second mobilization uh, doing defensive operations, uh, doing threat hunting, actually. Okay. Uh, so I stay in touch with those folks. So they're out there trying to uh, identify evidence of, uh, of a, what we call advanced persistent threats or nation state actors uh, that may already be resident on Department of Defense uh, information systems. We retired after about 23 years and uh, decided that uh, I wanted to give a go at, uh, at doing my own thing, right? You know, I had had a lot of fun building the cyber operations uh, squadron and uh, thought, hey, let me build something else. Um, so I founded Badger InfoSec which is a consultancy, small consultancy here in, uh, in Boise, primarily serving uh, small and medium-sized businesses, um, performing various different information security services for them, some technical, some non-technical. Um, and that lasted about a year, and I had a great time doing it, but uh, it just wasn't ultimately th the path that I wound up on today. And your path today is PlexTrack. Tell me what you do at PlexTrack. So at PlexTrack, I am the uh, Vice President of Success. Uh, what does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was an early stage employee at PlexTrack, and when we started, there was only three of us. Um, and so a lot of the skills, so one thing I failed to mention is uh, during the period when I was doing Badger InfoSec, um, I actually went through the, the entrepreneurial course uh, yes. offered by Mission 43, and I was a graduate of that, and it was a great course. We're so thankful for you. <laughs> <laughs> At PlexTrack, when I first started with them, we only had three people, and so we had someone who was doing the coding, someone who was doing the sales, and everything else was me. So I'm the VP of success, just make sure this all works. But, but today I lead the team that, uh, that helps people take our product and implement it in their environments, also do all the technical troubleshooting. Uh, we do some of the security uh, for those products, make sure all the proper firewalls are in place and the rules are, are configured correctly. Um, and we also handle um, a lot of uh, actual development of, uh, of various code that is used in conjunction with our web application. One of the top questions I get hands down by far is someone comes to me and says, hey, Allison, need some information on how I get into cybersecurity. And I am not a techie person, so I can help you with your pathways, and I would love to help everyone understand what those pathways look like. So I know from our previous conversation that there's, you break it down into two separate pathways, the technical and the not so technical. Can we talk about those and how they differ? Sure. 
Yeah, and you know, there's probably 20 different pathways, but broadly speaking, I, I like to explain it in terms of, of technical versus non-technical. You know, I think that when people think of people in information security, they've got this image in their head of someone who's got their hood up and they're in their yes. mom's basement, <laughs> right? And you know, they've got their giant, you know, 40 ounce Mountain Dew and they're Our hacking until three yeah. in the morning. Um, there are plenty of people, and I have great friends who do that, um, but they're the absolute minority. Okay. Um, they're, um, you know, they are, they are the people who we think of in the same way of when we think of people who play football, you know, the people who we see on Sundays, right? Right. And I'm not saying that, that you know, they're better than anybody else, but they are a rare breed, okay. right? Um, you know, I would say that there's probably close to 10 to 1 ratio of people who do things that are not that <laughs> in information security, if not more, okay. you know, to be quite honest with you. So, so let me kind of, you know, break it down into, into technical and non-technical, um, and then talk about maybe some of the various domains um, that exist in each one of those. Um, so I'll talk about the technical side, because that's what everybody, let's you know. Let's talk about the fun yeah, stuff first. Yeah, let's talk about the fun <laughs> stuff first, okay. Um, so, um, so let's put to the side the penetration tester, that person who's doing the hacking, if you will. Um, we'll talk about them later because they really are the minority. Um, people who are doing technical work in information security, um, the, primary, the, the primary role for them is actually just securing the network. It's making sure that you're locking the doors and you're closing the windows. You know, penetration testers, um, they come in and they try to test the defenses that are in place. But if you haven't put any defenses in place, then it's not a very exciting test. Right? You wouldn't hire someone to try to break into your house you know, to test your defenses if you didn't lock all your doors, alarm your, your, your alarm system and whatnot. And so there are a lot of various different technical sides of that defensive preparation phase, if you will, um, for an attack. You know, ensuring that you've, you've got the walls as high as you need them and there's no holes in them. It starts out actually with, uh, and one of the easiest areas to get into is with uh, basic what we call vulnerability management. So when someone says that I've been hacked, right, um, if they truly have been hacked, the vast, vast, vast majority of the time, the way that an attacker got into a system wasn't because they've got this really cool new exploit that only they know or it's a, a, this deep, dark secret. It's probably because they have software or services on their computers that already had known vulnerabilities that mm -hmm. the whole planet knows about that they just haven't patched yet. And so they haven't performed the regular routine, kind of boring maintenance of every quarter, every month, you know, every other week, depending upon you know, your resources, of scanning your environment and determining where do I have work to do? Where do I have things that are out of date? You know, um, That's not as exciting as I wanted it to be. <laughs> We're gonna get there, <laughs> don't we worry. Know. So Network Plus is a baseline to get you into vulnerability management. Some sort of network, okay. you know, networking and understanding is definitely important because you need that to understand how to target the, uh, the various things that you need to scan, okay. right? Um, but then you gotta go fix this stuff, right? Um, and so then there's tools that you can use. Nobody wants to go and log into 500 computers individually, right? And to fix uh, uh, the same piece of software that over and over like again, fun. not so much. <laughs> um, so then, the, you know, you, you get to learn tools um, that will then allow you to deploy the patches in a centralized fashion, right? And, and do that sort of thing. So that's one area um, that uh, that is a great starting spot for someone who okay. is looking to go down the technical path okay. um, in information security, right? Okay. Now that's fairly proactive, right? We're doing that thing on a regular basis. Um, but what about on the reactive side? So most of your large organizations have various sensors placed throughout their environment. And in fact, almost every computer is a sensor. Um, you've got Windows Defender probably on your Microsoft box, right? And if you have the enterprise versions of that, when certain things happen, they can report that back to a central location, right? And those are called uh, events. Or, okay. uh, and if those events, when they get to that central location, you have some additional software. It's called a security incident and event management system. Um, they suck in like a big giant vacuum cleaner, all of the data from all the sensors, the individual hosts, maybe some just things that are tapped into the network, monitoring traffic, and they feed them to people. And if there are anomalous, if there are, are things there that trip uh, rules, you know, we actually try to automate as much as we possibly can. The, the, the amount of data that comes into these things is mind boggling, right? And you can't sit there and it's not like the matrix. Nobody wants to sit <laughs> and, and watch a screen of uh, scroll, right? Um, and so if an event 
triggers a, a rule that generates an alert, um, it's up to somebody to go investigate that. Um, and so normally all this data is coming into something called a Security Operations Center or a SOC. Okay. Right? And if you were to ask 100 people about like how did they got their start in information security, a lot of them would tell you that they started as what's called a SOC analyst. Okay. Um, some people will call them alert monkeys, but I think that's kind of a derogatory <laughs> term. <laughs> well, I want to be an alert uh, monkey. No, but, uh, but they learn a lot in that position because they see, okay, what is the event that happened? Why do we have rules in place to think that this could be malicious? Okay. Um, and then they begin the process of investigation. Um, and so there's varying levels of that, right? And so most of the time they'll have what they call playbooks, okay. right? You know, it's just like in the military, right? We've, we, we've got standard operating procedures. When this thing happens, do these things. And um, based upon what they find in their investigation, they'll close the event out or they'll escalate it. You know, they'll try, if there truly is evidence that something malicious is happening in the environment, you need to get on that. Right. <laughs> that's, that's not something that can wait till tomorrow. Um, and so <clears throat> generally when, when you do have a confirmed or at least a highly suspected detection of malicious activity in an environment, um, that's when you're gonna activate what you would call an incident response team. Okay. Um, and generally, the members of your incident response team, this is not your entry level position. This okay. is something that those SOC analysts can graduate to. Okay. Um, once they've got experience, you know, as that front line, these are the people that take the handoff of the football and they go and proactively try to contain the, uh, the event, you know, if it's spreading throughout the environment, you know, let's go ahead and ensure that we've, we've bounded this, this infection, if you will. Um, then they will first you know, identify, contain, and then ultimately eradicate, right? Right. And then even after eradication, there's, there's reporting um, because obviously this thing happened because we didn't have the proper defenses in place. So what are our lessons learned? So there's an after action report, right? An right. AAR. Um, and so, um, so these people will then take what they learned in the course of the investigation and they will then work with their, their network team or their, you know, their IT team to, to make sure that it doesn't happen again. I mean, okay. you know, don't want to get bit twice by the same snake, no. right? <laughs> <laughs> what does it take for this person to graduate um, from that vulnerability up into the SOC analyst, mm -hmm. up into maybe an incident response team? Is this different levels of education or is it experience plus education? What, what would someone need to do pr to progress through that? Because I can say that most people that come to me when they say, I want to get in cybersecurity, mm -hmm. they know that the unemployment rate is zero percent, right, that they can find a job, they know that the earning potential is great, um, but what does it really mean for them realistically in terms of education if they wanted to go into that technical side? There's a lot of different paths, you know. Um, there is the traditional path of somebody who goes and gets a, a computer science degree from a university. Um, I would honestly say that that's not the normal route. Okay. Um, you know, you, the people who are, are techies um, oftentimes are, you know, choose your own adventure type people, right? Um, and so it really comes down to experience. Um, certifications will get you that first job. Okay. Um, or at least you can get you the interview for that first <laughs> job, right? Um, and, and actually a lot of, a lot of even entry level jobs do require certain certifications. If you want to work for the uh, Department of Defense as a contractor, so even out here, you know, in, in Boise, uh, well, actually, I think it's Meridian, um, we have out at the, uh, the old HP campus, um, that is where all the help desk calls and tickets come for the U.S. Navy. Okay. If you're on a boat in the middle of the Pacific um, and you've got a problem with the computer that's sitting on, you know, on your desk in your, your little, whatever they call a, a room on a ship, sorry, Air Force. I don't, I don't know, Air Force, no idea. We in your quarters. Um, <laughs> Um, and you have a problem, you actually call here to Idaho um, remotely. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, but all those people have to have what's called Security Plus okay. um, to ensure that they have a baseline understanding. And then that's, a, that's a federal requirement. Okay. Um, and because of that, um, a lot of contract positions will, will require this. And it's not a difficult certification to get, and it's a great body of knowledge um, as well. So but you need to be good with um, coding or with what kind of what kind of spin up would someone need to get to get uh, aside from the free services? What, mm -hmm. what kind of spin up could someone get into to get into that? Well, you mentioned coding, but it all depends upon what area of information security you, you want to go in. Um, you know, even on the technical side, it, 
the world of network security, you know, things that are wrong on machines or virtual machines is very, very, very different than the world of things that are wrong in applications, okay. right? So there could be absolutely nothing wrong with a machine, but if there's a vulnerability in the application that's running on it, and I can just, you know, I can go to the, the login screen and log in, you know, with admin and password, um, that's, a, that's a problem, right? Okay. Um, and so um, if you are interested in getting into information security for applications, web applications, AppSec is what it's referred to, then yeah, absolutely. Um, learning uh, some of the basics uh, of coding, uh, that's great. Um, also, uh, probably also learning some of those uh, fundamentals of modern, how the modern internet works, okay. right? Um, when, when you click on a button on a web page, it generates a certain type of, of message, right? And it sends that message someplace and then there's a response. And understanding that flow of traffic um, on the internet. So, so that's a great place. But ultimately, you've got to get your hands dirty. And if you don't have someone paying you to do the job, um, and you really want to do that job, do it yourself. Play, show people what you can do, and that's how you're going to that's how you're going to get your first uh, your first gigs in information security. That's definitely on the technical side. So yes. definitely have security plus, network plus, great idea. And then depending on what you want to do, maybe some coding. Yeah, okay. absolutely. But not necessary. Not necessary. Okay. No, absolutely. What about the non-technical side? So the non-technical side, well, first I should explain what is the non-technical side. Yes, please. Right? <laughs> so you know, if I'm not doing the hacking thing and I'm not doing the drudgery of scanning networks, um, you know, what am I doing in information security? So we talked about you know, the, the need to put defenses in place, right? To, and, and the technical scanning is a defense, but it's the execution of a plan, of a procedure, right? It is what we call a control. And so if you have a business and you want to secure your environment, you're probably not going to like whip out a scratch pad and start thinking of things to do. Someone smarter than you has already figured this out. Somebody has made a plan, an op board, if you will, right? Um, and a list of things that you should do based upon you know, what's in your environment. And if you're not doing these things, you're probably got unlocked doors and, and open windows, right? Um, and so we call these control frameworks. What that is, is it's a list of controls, things that you should be doing, best practices, that has been developed by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, okay. NIST, um, and to secure your environment, right? Okay. And so you have people whose job it is to not necessarily implement all the controls um, or to test those controls, but to ensure that you have um, all the procedures in place that you have all the, the proper uh, things documented so that you've got a plan in place that other people can go execute. Okay. As silly as it sounds. So you're making the plan mm -hmm. for the people on the other side. And tracking the execution of the plan, okay. you know, and perhaps even grading the execution of the plan, right? So normally if you're starting out in this area, you're going to start out in uh, is something called an information assurance uh, person. It could be whatever level it's gonna be, right? You are assuring that your information is being protected by the controls, so hence information assurance. So you're probably not going to be actually like going out and grading people, um, but you're going to be collecting um, how people have said that they are implementing things. And then, you know, if you want to talk about how far up the food chain you can go, you that really is a great path. Both paths can end up in management and okay. leadership, right? But that's actually a great path also to end up in, in a leadership position in information security in a, in a company. Because at the end of the day, whoever's a leader isn't going to be hands on keyboard doing the things, right? Right. They're really there to ensure, are we, are we doing the right things? Is there somebody who is doing the right things? Are they doing them at the right intervals? Are they doing them thoroughly you know, into our standards? So the non-technical route and the understanding of the controls that you have to have in place, you know, what's my defensive plan and am I doing it right? Those are the ones that um, you often see bubbling up into positions uh, such as chief information security officer okay. um, or director of security if you don't have one of those in your environment. And what does the basic uh, education and skill set look like for that side of things? Sure. So that one's a little more nebulous. Okay. Uh, it, it really is. Um, but generally, um, Having some understanding uh, of the technical side is helpful, um, but you're looking for those jobs titled like information assurance person, you know, specialist or something like that. 
Um, but there are certifications you can get um, for this to demonstrate. Um, you might not use them right away, um, but uh, organizations like uh, ISACA, it's one of the professional organizations that I mentioned, they have certifications um, that demonstrate you know, what level of maturity you are in your ability to perform an audit, right? Okay. Or to assess things. Um, it's, it's all about methodology and, you know, and finding things. Honestly, a lot of the people who I see in, in the civilian sector, in the non-technical space, did get their start as information assurance specialists in some branch uh, of the DOD. Okay. Um, but um, but there's, there's really not a clear-cut path. It's one of those areas where, you know, you're not going to go to a college and there's going to be a, an information, you know, assurance uh, course for you. Uh, but uh, a computer science, you know, background and understanding is great. Those other certifications are also helpful um, in, in those paths as well. Um, I didn't come through that path, so I don't have as much experience. <laughs> I actually skipped both paths and just went straight to management. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I, I, like, I like this path a lot, so I tend to dabble uh, in that uh, as well. But there's plenty of opportunities and avenues uh, available. You don't have to be uh, a hands-on keyboard you know, using the, the latest and greatest exploits you pulled off the dark web um, to have a very successful career in information security. So what is the Idaho cybersecurity environment look like? You mentioned earlier that nationwide we are at least a million short on professionals and skilled workers in this environment. But what is cybersecurity in Idaho right now? Well, you know, when you talk about cybersecurity and who you might be employed by, you can either be employed by an enterprise, right, or company where they have their internal teams, the internal functions, um, or you can be employed by a consultancy. Okay. Um, and so generally um, for really small and medium-sized businesses never get to that level of having their own in-house team. They're gonna have IT people, right? Um, but if they have budget, if they have regulatory reasons, they're gonna go out and they're gonna hire a consultancy to come in and do an assessment uh, for them. Um, so, as far as organizations in Idaho, it's really not about Idaho or where you're at. It's really more about the size of your organization and the maturity as to whether or not you have those functions, okay. right? Um, I would say that it's really not until you're, you, you've grown behind a, uh, above about 500 employees that you're gonna see dedicated uh, information security functions in most organizations. Okay. Um, especially ones that aren't IT heavy or ones that don't have regulatory reasons for that. Obviously, we work with very sensitive data. We've got 60 people, we've got security people. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so it's all about the risk tolerance of the organization. Um, so if you're looking, you know, to, you know, work at, um, you know, for example, Blue Cross out here has got a great security team, right? Because they deal with a lot of sensitive information. You know, Sandy Dunn heads up an awesome uh, group of people out there. Count's got a great uh, security team as well. Matt Koonsman, shout out to you. Um, you know, but um, obviously Truck Stop, t uh, sorry, Intuit. Um, <laughs> your large, uh, uh, Cradle Point. Your, your large organizations are gonna have those positions um, and they're gonna have them at, at varying degree uh, levels. Okay. Mostly, you will find that if you you find entry level people, they will be in the entry level jobs in an enterprise. But once they develop some skills, that's where the paths open in the consultancies, and those are really tend to be more national or multinational. It's really not more about where you're at. Um, most I work with a lot of consultancies. I work with all the largest consultancies uh, in the country, and whenever I'm on a call, everyone is all over the place. Um, the days uh, of having centralized offices are. Are, are, are behind us, and that was even before COVID, and that's because of the talent shortage. Um, if you're on the technical side, definitely some experience is, is nice to have, and almost a little bit of a requirement. And so, you know, if if you went down the path of getting that Network Plus certificate, right, you may not actually start out doing vulnerability management. Even you might be told you're the guy who actually gets to go and fix the things that they found when they scanned the network, you know, and they, they actually did the vulnerability management program. You're the guy who has to go patch the things, right? Or you're deploying servers or you're deploying switches or things like that. Even if you're going through a formal program, a four-year program, um, you know, we've had a couple of interns. Uh, it's really, really difficult to get a position without some sort of experience. So if you are going through a formal program, don't forget to get your internship, right? Uh, and and make sure that it, that it counts. And uh, you're not just, you know, slinging papers, you know, that you're actually getting some good hands-on experience. Um, and, and don't accept the first thing that comes along. You know, understand the, the, that even though you're an intern, your time is valuable, so you expect to be given valuable work. 
where are the people coming from outside of networking? Because I know here in Idaho, we're lucky, we're special. We have Mission 43 and we host a lot of networking events, which you've been to quite a few. So, um, but where are you specifically hiring out of in PlexTrack or even with past organizations? Well, I, I probably shouldn't say this on camera, but I target people I know. You know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, it's it's really hard, um, and and I'm actually like I said I'm fairly new to the game. You okay. know, obviously I didn't have to do deal with the job boards and things like that in, okay. the, in the DoD, and up until recently I've been able to work my network. But at some point you've worked your network, right? right. And and you've got to keep growing. So we we are using job boards. Okay. Um, we do use professional recruiters, but at, at an entry level position, those that's probably not a path okay. for you. You know, your professional recruiters are, are you know are available for things like that. A lot of a lot of things are done on contract basis these days, um, and so even for the Department of Defense or even large organizations. So, um, I was interviewing someone last night, and they're currently on a contract um, to do work for Microsoft. They're okay. not a Microsoft employee, um, so believe it or not, temp agencies. Okay. Um, so, and we've got a couple of those here in the Valley that specialize uh, in technical services. Um, I, I know people at a lot of them and their competitors, so I'm not going to name anyone. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, but we do have, you know, we have staffing agencies that specialize. And believe it or not, uh, more than you would expect here, um, because Idaho National Labs on the east side, um, most of those facilities and the, uh, and the infrastructure for those facilities is run by contract. Okay. So I know I mentioned this earlier, but I think, I think we've covered everything. But my last thing about about our conversation today is I want people to leave with a good nugget of advice. And so whether it's something that you wish someone had told you or something that you could give to someone that is just starting out their second career, their first career, and going down the cybersecurity pathway, what is that nugget that you would give them? Secure yourself first. Um, and because when I get a candidate, the very first thing I do is go, we call it footprinting. I scour everything I can out there, records, public records, not public records, um, dumps. Um, I'm going to take your email address and I'm going to run it against known, uh, known breaches um, to help me determine where you've been going. Um, you know, like, what was it, Ashley Madison? Like, if you're, if I find your, <laughs> if, if I find your, uh, if I find your email address uh, is one of the records in the in the breach from Ashley Madison, I'm not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm probably not going to hire you to be honest with you. I'm off um, the list. Yeah, if you don't know what Ashley <laughs> Madison is, you might want to, you might not want to look that up at uh, on your work computer. <laughs> um, so. Uh, secure your social media. Um, I have found some really interesting things that people that I otherwise would have thought were great candidates. I'm like, nope. Okay. Um, don't be political. Doesn't matter which side of the spectrum you're on. Uh, you know, you want to you want to rant and rave. That's great. Do it over a beer in, in a bar with your friends. Because um, if you put it out there, someone's even if you know, like, oh, well, I'm only sharing this with my friends. Your friends have screen capture tools, right? right. Uh, and they can share that stuff. Um, so clean up your clean up your digital footprint. Okay. Uh, do that, and then secure yourself against dumb breaches by doing things like um, using a password manager. It sounds so simple. You can get free ones, uh, like LastPass offers a free version. Um, because if I see that you are not practicing what you're preaching, um, you're not being a good steward of your own personal information. Why would I give you a job guarding mine? Right. Right. So clear up your digital footprint and secure yourself and your own passwords first. Absolutely. And then teach your mom. <laughs> and then teach your mom to do that. And then probably grandma too. Yes. Perfect. Exactly. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. I know you've got a lot of things in your inbox right now waiting for you and we're probably the cause of that, but your time is precious. We are very thankful for you giving some of that and sharing with our members the path to cybersecurity. Well, thanks for the opportunity and, and thank you Mission 43 for everything that you're doing for Idaho veterans. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>